Now I present a very simplified version of the endogenous growth model that Paul Roma proposed in 1990. The original paper is the one by Paul Roma, Endogenous Technological Change in the Journal of Political Economy, and uh, two textbook treatments that I find, find nice and accessible are by David Weil, Economic Growth, uh, in the third edition. That's chapter 8, if I remember correctly, and Jones and Folra, Introduction to Economic Growth. Um, which is chapter 5 in this case. The starting point for this is that in the solo model we've seen that long-run economic growth is driven by technological progress. So there is nothing else that can explain long-run economic growth and physical capital accumulation alone would only lead to level effects in the long run and growth effects in the medium run. However, technological progress was actually assumed to be constant and exogenous in the solo model. And that's <clears throat> somehow not really satisfying because we assume that something grows to explain why something else is growing. And of course, what we would finally want to know is why there is technological progress in the first place. Now that implies that we have to explain technological progress within the model itself, endogenously. And this was for quite a while after the solo model a huge challenge because if we want to produce new technologies to some extent in the model, then we need to compensate those who come up with these new ideas, the scientists and the engineers and so on. But in the model of perfect competition, the production factors, labor and final goods sector and uh, capital basically get the full compensation and the full uh, income and there is nothing left with which we can compensate the scientists. So to some extent we would need a model with imperfect competition where there are profits and the firms use these profits to compensate the researchers and actually these profits are also the incentive to carry out research and development in the first place because then you have a certain monopoly right on the good that you invented. And Paul Roma was the first to successfully solve this problem in 1990 and this really constituted a breakthrough in economic growth theory. However, the model that he proposed is really rather complex and not so accessible to uh, bachelor students. So what I will do here is to uh, present a very simplified version of this model that is accessible also to bachelor students and that still contains many of the important aspects that, this, that the Roma model itself um, contains, but it also abstracts from many of them, in particular this imperfect competition uh, story. But if you are interested in uh, the, the full model, then there is also a lecture cast on that where you can um, that you can watch. Now we start with this simple model that illustrates how a research and development sector can be integrated in an uh, economic growth model. And this simple model, of course, can be extended in various directions to address at least some of the critiques that confront the basic model and the next video will um, basically address one of these concerns, namely the strong scale effect that is predicted by the Roma model. So let's start with the assumptions. In contrast to the solo model, there are now two sectors of production. Not only the final goods sector that produced the uh, final output or consumption aggregate that you also have in the solo model that the people consume basically and can also invest or save. But there is also a research and development sector in which new ideas are created. Now labor is used in both sectors and we abstract from physical capital in the production of final goods and uh, ideas. So labor is the only production uh, factor and the workers that work in the final goods sector produce this consumption good that can also be saved, so it's also an investment good. And the workers in the R&D sector develop the new ideas or technologies that raise productivity in the next step. So therefore we have a labor allocation at the economic uh, level and that's that the total number of workers, L, either are employed 
final good sector, LY, or in the research and development sector, LA. So L is the total population size or the labor force, so we again assume that there is full employment, LY the number of workers, and LA uh, the scientists, and of course they have to add up for labor market capital. Now workers produce output without physical capital, as I said, and with constant returns to scale. So we have output as a function of labor input, and why are the number of workers working in the final goods sector, and A is the productivity of these workers, and this productivity is determined by the state of technologies. Now new technologies are produced in the second sector of the economy, that is the research and development sector, and there is again the assumption of a linear production technology, so we have the time derivative of the stock of technologies, so the flow of new ideas is a positive function of the number of scientists, so LA is the number of people employed in the research and development sector, that's straightforward, because if you have more researchers, then the flow of ideas would be, say, the Vespartus higher, then we have delta is the productivity of scientists, so if they are better trained, better educated, then they are more productive and can come up with more ideas. That's also um, straightforward. And what might not be that straightforward is that we also have the stock of ideas popping up on the right-hand side of this equation. And this is an intertemporal um, uh, externality. So it's basically uh, a standing on shoulders externality, meaning that past technological improvements make future technological improvements easier. So they increase the productivity of scientists. And the rationale behind that is that it is easier, for example, to come up with the smartphone if you already know how to produce the standard mobile phone. Or, <clears throat> as another example, it might be impossible to come up with a nuclear reactor if you have the state of technologies, say, of the Middle Ages or something. So kind of technological progress in the past makes future technological progress um, more likely to some extent. However, what's important for later reference is that there is an implicit assumption here, namely that the exponent of A is 1, so that there is truly a linearity. But one could assume, and this is done in later chapters, that actually the externality is still present, but it is weaker than under the implicit assumption that the exponent is equal to 1. And this has implications for the long run balanced growth rate, as we will see in later chapters. Now we make a strongly simplifying assumption as compared to the full Roma model, namely that the fraction of scientists is constant and exogenously given. We denote this by mu, so that's the number of researchers, of scientists, divided by the population size, the fraction of scientists. In the Roma model, the full Roma model, that's an endogenous variable that actually adjusts at equilibrium two different um, effects that you could have on the economy. Now here we assume it's a parameter which makes life much easier, but we will see that many of the insights of the Roma model still carry over to this very simplified version. Then, under this assumption, we can plug it into the research uh, production function and we would get the flow of ideas positively depending on the fraction of scientists in the economy, where now we express the number of scientists as the expression mu times L, which is the same basically, it's the fraction of scientists multiplied by the population size. Now if we denote the growth rate of the variable by gamma, sub the variable that we are interested in, so here in this case gamma A, then the growth rate of technologies would be this expression here divided by the stock of technologies and we would have on the left hand side the growth rate and on the right hand side the fraction of scientists, the productivity of scientists and the population size because that determines also the number of scientists. Now, As we see here, due to this linearity assumption, the growth rate of the economy would be constant if the right hand side is constant. Later, when we assume that the intertemporal knowledge spillover, so the standing on shoulders effect is smaller than 1 here in the exponent, then we would see that the right hand side is not constant, but would decrease over time for a constant uh, mu, delta, and L. But now, here with the assumption that we have, we also compute output of the final goods sector under the assumption that the fraction of scientists is constant because we can um, 
infer that if mu is the fraction of cyclists, then 1 minus mu is the fraction of workers. So we can compute the number of workers and we can plug the number of workers into the final goods production function that we know from the previous slide. Um, we plug this in, so we have productivity here still, uh, then we plug in uh, Ly, which is 1 minus mu times L. And then we can compute per capita output, which is just this expression here, aggregate output divided by the number of workers. So that would again be per capita GDP or per worker GDP. And it would depend positively on productivity and it depends negatively on the fraction of scientists because if you increase the fraction of scientists, you decrease the fraction of workers in the economy. But as we will see later on, there's an intertemporal trade-off because if you increase the, um, num the fraction of scientists that decreases output in the final good sector, but it would increase over time productivity. So you have a short run versus long run trade-off when you change the fraction of scientists in the economy. Now since mu is constant and exogenous, the expression for per capita GDP that we had on the previous slide would imply that the growth rate of per capita GDP actually depends only on the growth rate of technologies because this term here is constant. So if you compute the growth rate of Y, you would see that this is the same as the growth rate of A. So we have again the technological progress is equal to the growth rate of the economy in terms of per capita GDP. And now we can plug in technological progress on the right hand side as we know it from the research and development sector that we saw for the growth rate already for a constant fraction of uh, researchers. And we will see that the growth rate of per capita GDP is also given by the fraction of scientists, the productivity of scientists and the number of people in the economy. And now we see that the growth rate of the economy is not anymore assumed as exogenously given, but it's the rate of technological progress, but the rate of technological progress itself is now endogenously explained and the function of underlying parameters in the economy. Now what's the interpretation of this endogenously derived economic growth rate? Now, technological progress and economic growth both positively depend on the fraction of scientists in the economy, mu. And that's intuitively clear because uh, if mu increases, the economy puts more resources in the R&D sector. And that means that technological progress would ceteris paribus be faster. Now this parameter could, for example, be affected by governmental research and development policies. So the government could subsidize research and development of private firms, or it could itself increase investment of universities and universities and uh, public research institutes, and all that would increase the fraction of scientists in the economy and would increase technological progress in the long run. So it would increase the flow of ideas. Then there was another parameter, the productivity of scientists that had a positive effect on economic growth. Well, that's also clear because if scientists are better trained, they would see that these paradigms come up with more um, ideas and better um, uh, innovations and so on and so forth. Now, also this parameter could be affected by governmental education policies. If the population is better educated, then more likely that people will become uh, scientists. Or if universities are better funded, then this would imply that um, people would get a better education, basically, and might be more likely to become scientists. So also that would increase the flow of ideas. And finally, the population size had a positive effect, because a larger population means <coughs> more workers in the research and development sector, ceteris paribus, for a constant fraction of people in the sector. And often the argument is put forward for this effect in reality, that if you have a larger population, then the likelihood that you have geniuses in, is higher, so that you have people like Isaac Newton or so um, in the population is higher if you have a larger population to start with. So this is a short interpretation of the different um, components that determine the economic growth rate in this very simplified endogenous economic growth model. Now based on this, 
we provide a short comparative statics exercise where we suppose that the government raises research and development subsidies for firms and this leads to a situation where firms hire more scientists to come up with uh, new ideas and that leads overall at the aggregate level to an increase in the fraction of scientists in the economy and therefore correspondingly to a decrease in the number of production workers. Now what would happen? We know from the growth rate of per capita GDP and of uh, the stock of technologies that this is a positive function of the fraction of scientists. So if we increase the fraction of scientists, the growth rate of technologies would increase. However, at the same time, we would have a fall in the level of per capita GDP initially because um, there are more people working in the research and development sector and correspondingly fewer workers working in the final goods sector to produce um, output. However, the increase in the growth rate actually implies that productivity grows faster in the long run. So we have exactly this in the temporal trade-off that I briefly uh, mentioned before, that you see an initial level effect as a drop in output in the final goods sector due to the fact that mu um, increased and therefore fewer people work in the final goods sector. But then you see an increase in the growth rate of per capita GDP because productivity A grows faster due to the knowledge production function of the research and development sector and the increased number of scientists in the economy. And this evolution can also be illustrated graphically in a nice way, where we have two uh, graphs here. On the horizontal axis we have time, and on the vertical axis we have the log of um, the stock of technologies in the first diagram, and the log of per capita GDP in the second diagram. <clears throat> and then we observe growth of the economy, of per capita GDP uh, here and of technologies here, up to the point at which the government increases subsidies and therefore the fraction of scientists increases and the fraction of uh, workers in the final good sector decreases. So that means uh, the slope of a variable in logs is actually the growth rate and this growth rate is the same. So these two lines are parallel here. Now at the point where the government increases research and development subsidies, production in the final good sector falls that's what we see here. However, in exchange, the growth rate of technology, so technological progress, increases. So this line here becomes steeper, and that means that also this line here becomes steeper because the two lines have the same slope, as we know. So because the growth rate of the economy is the same as the rate of technological progress. And that implies that in the short run, the economy uh, can produce less because of the shift of workers from final goods production to uh, technology production. But in the long run, it could actually produce more. So had we here um, a straight uh, this, this line continued, then at some point here the economy would basically overtake the old economy. So we have an intertemporal trade-off. The people here in the economy might see a welfare decrease because output and consumption is lower, but the people living here would see a welfare increase. And that might also be an explanation for why governments typically underfund research and development, which has been found in various studies that the optimal investment in research and development is much higher than actual investment in research and development in virtually all economies in the world. And one reason could be that uh, in the short run, people do not benefit, so they would have a welfare loss. But only in the long run, people benefit quite a lot, potentially. But governments do not care that much about the long run when they face re-election, for example. So they try to maximize uh, welfare of the uh, people living in the economy in the short run. Um, and this kind of political economy explanation might be a reason for why research and development is typically underfunded. Finally, we come to one of the critiques that the Roma model has faced. And this is rooted in the implication of the model that economic growth is faster if the population size is larger. And this is called the strong 
scale effect. Now, <clears throat> do we see this effect in the data? There are at least two interpretations of the model, and the first one is that it holds for individual countries. Now then, if it holds for individual countries, we would have to observe in the data that a larger country in terms of the population size must grow faster than a smaller country. However, this is not the case. So if we look, for example, at the United States and Canada, the United States does not systematically grow faster than Canada, or Germany and Austria, Germany does not grow systematically faster than Austria does. So from, and also if we look at cross-country evidence, we don't find uh, evidence that the population size increases economic growth. The interpretation too, however, would be that it does not apply to individual countries, but to aggregates such as the OECD altogether or the G7 countries, which are the technology leaders. And there, the model has some explanatory power, particularly from a historical perspective, but it still clashes with the stylized facts of the 20th century and 21st century, basically. So we observe in history until the mid of the 19th century that indeed, as the population size increased, economic growth also uh, increased. So there was kind of a hyper exponential growth phase during that uh, period. But then this uh, relationship broke down and further increases in the population size did not lead to increases in economic growth, if at all economic growth um, decreased somewhat uh, over the last um, uh, decades. And uh, basically that would imply that also, also interpretation two, also in case of interpretation two, the model clashes with the stylized Facts. Now this has led to extensions of the model, particularly important the one that uh, Chad Jones uh, proposed in 1995, to remove this strong scale effect, as we will see in the next uh, chapter on this Jones model, uh, to replace it with the weak scale effect, actually, that population growth and economic growth are positively related, but not the population size 